It was only when he was back in the saddle, wearing his de-ice goggles and driving once more into a roar of fiery air, that he realized he'd arrived at a point where he must make an immediate choice. Stop and piss now, or allow his bladder to rupture, <laughs> which would cause him to die of an internal infection or drench himself and freeze to death. But he kept going. He guessed there remained 100 kilometers to cover. He was doing 40 kilometers an hour, two and a half hours. Clearly impossible. But still, he did not stop. He distracted himself by attempting to recall the last occasion he had urinated. <laughs> Surely it was at Long Yearbin Airport while he waited for his luggage late at night the day before yesterday. 35 hours without a piss. Had he simply forgotten? Was he really that busy? The moment he understood that it was the cold that had confused him and made him add the extra day, he stopped, and in his eagerness, half fell off the snowmobile onto the track. He heard Jan's machine bump into the rear of his, but he did not look back as he hurried away. It was a different kind of terrain they were on now. Their route made a shallow S through a, gu shallow S through a gully enclosed on each side by a 30-foot wall of rock and ice. A vestigial sense of propriety drew him to the base of one wall, as though to a urinal, where he stood doubled up with his back to the wind and used his teeth to pull off the outer glove on his right hand. He heard Jan call out to him, but he could not bear to be spoken to now. Biting at the end of each finger in turn, he worked the glove lining off. Immediately, his hand became numb and slow. It took him more than two minutes to unfasten the zip of his snowmobile suit, and then he found that he needed two hands to get through his jacket to the shoulder releases of his salopettes. So he pulled off the gloves of his left hand with his slow-moving right. Once more, his goggles were misting up and freezing over. But he had to admire his own calm as he delved and tugged through the layers, as his precious body warmth bled out into the vicious cold and the wind whipped round his back, into the cliff and onto his face. Only in the final seconds, when his clumsy pink hand, as cold as a stranger's, reached into his underpants, did he think he might lose control. But at last, with a joyous shout that was lost to the gale, he directed his stream against the wall. His mistake. <laughs> was to wait a few seconds at the end, as men of his age tended to do, mindful that there might be more. He should have turned his head to hear what Jan had shouted. Or perhaps he could have avoided the inevitable only if he had accepted one of the other invitations to the Seychelles or Johannesburg <laughs> or San Diego. Or if, as he thought later with some bitterness, climate change, radical warming above the Arctic Circle was actually taking place and was not a figment of the activist imagination. For when his business was done, he discovered that his penis had attached itself to the zip of his snowmobile suit, <laughs> had frozen hard along its length, the way only living flesh can do on sub-zero metal. He wasted precious seconds, gazing at his situation in shock. <laughs> when at last he pulled tentatively, he experienced intense pain, and he was already in pain from the cold. He remained standing with his legs apart, facing the rock wall. He did not dare do as one might with a sticking plaster and rip himself away in one stroke. And he had read of an American hiking alone in the wilderness who had got his arm trapped behind a rock and sawed through his own elbow with a penknife. <laughs> Beard was not that kind of dedicated person. And after all, an elbow, a forearm, a hand were one of a pair. <laughs> and, to an extent, disposable. <laughs> As the polar wind raged against the cliff face and rebounded against his shivering form, he watched in horror as his penis shrank even smaller and curled tighter against the zip. And not only was it shrinking before his eyes, but it was turning white. Not the white of a blank page, but the sparkling silver of a Christmas bauble. He was close to panicking, but could not bring himself to call for help. It was additionally difficult not to panic, with his head smothered by carpet underlay and a thick helmet and goggles with diminishing visibility. For want of anything else to do, he covered himself with a cupped hand, a hand like a block of ice. He was beginning to feel sluggish, 
even sleepy, the way people are supposed to do in extreme cold, and his thoughts lurched in slow motion. He saw his colleague Jock Braby on TV proclaim an obituary through a forgiving smile. He went to see global warming for himself. <laughs> Nonsense. He would survive. But this was it, a life without a penis. <laughs> How all his ex-wives, especially Patrice, would enjoy themselves. <laughs> but he would tell no one. He would live quietly with his secret. He would live in a monastery, do good works, visit the poor. And as he stood dithering, he wondered for the first time in his adult life whether there actually might be purposeful design in human lives and entities like Greek gods imposing ironies, extracting revenge, imposing their rough justice. But the rationalist in Michael Beard died hard. There was a problem and he should attempt to solve it. He was reaching lugubriously into the inside pocket of his jacket. In his postdoc years, he had worked for a while in low temperature physics, but even as a schoolboy, as fat so beard, bad at games, a swat at science, he knew the basics. Pure ethanol froze at minus 114 degrees centigrade, everyone knew that. Brandy at 80% proof would be 40% ethanol by volume, giving a freezing point of minus 45.6. At last the hip flask was in his hands, the top came off after only a brief struggle, and generously he poured his libation, and within seconds he was free. When he put aside, when he put away his unfortunate penis, it was as it was as hard as ice, but no longer white. It was also stinging, an excruciating hot needle pain that slowed his efforts to get dressed. After ten minutes in one piece at last, he turned and stumbled back onto the track and found his guide waiting. Sorry about that, call of nature. Jan caught hold of his elbow. You in bad shape, man. Look, you drop your boots off your neck. We both go on my bike. We're going to pick up your machine later. He let himself be guided to Jan's snowmobile. And it was there that the calamity finally happened. As he raised a leg to hoist himself onto his place behind the guide, he felt and even thought he heard a terrible rending pain in his groin, a cracking and a parting, like a birth, like a glacier carving. He gave a shout and Jan turned to steady him and settle him in place. It's one hour is all, you'll be okay. Something cold and hard had dropped from Beard's groin and fallen down inside the leg of his long johns and was now lodged above his kneecap. He put his hands between his legs and there was nothing. He put his hands on his knee, and the hideous object, less than two inches long, was stiff like a bone. It did not feel, or it no longer felt, like a part of himself. Jan kick-started the engine, and they set off at a crazy speed, careening over ice ridges as hard as concrete, swerving round near vertical banks like reckless adepts in a velodrome. Why was he not home in bed? Beard cowered out of the wind behind Jan's broad back. The burning sensation in his groin was spreading. His cock had slipped round and was nestling under the crook of his knee. And they were speeding in the wrong direction, hurtling northward towards the pole, deeper into the wilderness, into the frozen dark when they should have been rushing off towards a well-lit emergency room in Long Yerbian. Surely the intense cold would work to his advantage, keeping the organ alive. <laughs> but microsurgery in Long Yerbian, population 1500, Beard thought he was about to be sick, but instead he slipped his hands through the belt at the back of Jan's jacket and let his head drop onto his protector's spine and fell into a doze. And it was only the sudden silencing of the snowmobile's motor that woke him, and he saw looming above him out of the ice the dark hull of the ship where he would spend the week. Thank you. <laughs>